welcome to Midwest Animal Welfare Society's The Good News for All Creatures podcast. I'm your host, Kelly McAtee, founder and dog trainer, interviewing animal welfare professionals, discussing careers in the industry, current events, and animal welfare issues, giving people hope by sharing our faith. Join us on our mission to help more animals and humans. Let's get started. Hi, guys. Welcome to Midwest Animal Welfare Society's The Good News for All Creatures podcast. I'm so excited to have my guest, Caitlin Quinn, here with Heart Speak. Um, she has agreed to talk with us about her experience in the animal industry, what her organization um, is about, how they help more animals, and how you can get involved helping them. So thank you so much, Caitlin, for agreeing to do this. Thank and- you. Yes, and Barry, uh, our, my co-host, is um, sleeping here. Um, so we've talked a little bit um, before we started recording, and so I'm just going to have Caitlin uh, just jump right in and start to tell us about her organization. And, you know, they've, they're they in like 21 countries around the world, um, how they got started and how um, you know, you can get involved helping them. So, um, Caitlin, th- can you tell us about your organization? Sure. It's called HeartSpeak. Um, and I can't take the credit for founding it. It was founded by our executive director, Lisa Prince Fischler. Um, she was a professional photographer, uh, pet photographer who was really kind of introduced to this, um, the way that a lot of us are introduced to to this field she kind of stumbled into it um someone had contacted her actually from the organization that i used to work with uh animal farm foundation we had uh we were both a national advocacy group and we had uh rescue on site and we needed adoption photos so someone from our organization contacted lisa she started to take adoption photos for the dogs that we had in our care and she realized that this was a, a big need. Um, and this was in 2008, 2009 that she started to do that volunteer work. So I think we all have to think back to like cell phone photos weren't that great. Yes, we yes. That. <laughs> yes <laughs> the cameras are so much better now. Exactly. So the the skills that professional photographers could bring with a DSLR camera, you know, a digital camera um, were really game changing for so many, so many people and so many organizations. And what Lisa found um, was that there were a lot of other pet photographers who were also getting kind of like approached individually or who hadn't yet thought to kind of volunteer their services this way. And so she started HeartSpeak to really organize those efforts and make sure that um, artists of all kinds, not just photographers, but um, graphic designers and portrait artists who wanted to be able to impact the lives of animals who were still waiting for their homes or who were in need in some way. Um, She really wanted to organize that effort and make sure that people were getting the resources they needed to do that, or even just kind of the community to talk about, Hey, is anybody else encountering this struggle? Or I'm not sure how to get started. Like how, what's your advice for approaching a shelter or rescue? Um, And that's how HeartSpeak was born. And from there, we kind of developed our programs to fit emerging needs. So as we're kind of solving a little bit of the photography problem, we realized um, it's wonderful to have professional photographers donating their services, but not every shelter has that. So how do we start to train the staff and volunteers at the shelters? So that was another program that we developed. Um, And from there, in those situations, we realized that this training is wonderful, but after we leave, people need resources to build um, better marketing materials. So they needed templates for social posts and for printable materials and to kind of fit those larger marketing needs. So that's how kind of the third uh, big program that we have developed from there. And the most exciting thing that we have done recently um, is launch a free stock photography project for shelters and rescues um, that's really aimed at diversifying the kinds of photos that are offered, both in the content of the humans, so more inclusive photos of more diverse populations, and really more representative of the kinds of animals that we find in shelters. So not always purebred looking dogs or or cats that look like they also might be <laughs> some, you know, obscure breed of cat. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the total overview of what HeartSpeak yes. is doing. And it all fits under this umbrella of like, let's 
amplify the life-saving work that shelters and rescues are doing yes. by making the marketing piece a little bit easier. Yes, it's so amazing. Brings tears to my eyes because it's just so wonderful. You know, all my dogs are rescues, various from a shelter. I don't know why he's not in his bed, which would be a little more comfortable, but, uh, you know, and so if these, um, the first thing that you see when you go to your website is um, seen equals uh, saved, right? Or seen equals, yeah, seen um, equals saved. saved, right? Yeah. So, um, if they don't get seen, if the animals are not seen, how are the, how is anyone going to know, right, that they need a home? And so, um, you know, that was right. How I got into the animal industries when I realized, um, you know, how many animals were dying every day in our country because there's not enough homes and there's more than just one reason for that, right? You know, um, people not having the tools to be able to deal with them, you know, shelters and rescues being overwhelmed, not having enough space for these animals and the resources. So to be able to move them <clears throat> quickly and to be able to help them, right? Because they say, right, a picture uh, says a thousand words or, you yeah. know, to be able to, you know, help people, help the animals get seen. And that's really awesome that you, that it's not just photographers. So people can, you know, and maybe you can talk a little bit more about that too, um, okay. as how people can, you know, get involved and, um, you know, if they have uh, talents and gifts in this area, you know. Yeah, please. We're always looking for more members. Um, yes. So the that original program that Lisa kind of devised is called Artists Helping Animals. And she, uh, it turned into a membership program. So, um, the people that join it, they pay an annual donation, but I also want to make really clear that like, that's flexible. Um, we don't ever want finances to stand in the way. Like the program donation just goes into us helping to create more resources for that particular program, um, and help helped it really be sustainable over the, the last 13 years or celebrating our 13th birthday. Um, but awesome. happy birthday. <laughs> but um, it's really very flexible because we don't ever want it to be like a, you're an insider and outsider kind of situation. Um, and the way that shelters and rescues can get involved is we have a find an artist map on our website where you can search by your state or your city and kind of locate who's in your area. That's most important for the, um, Go there. yeah, perfect. That's most important for the photographers. Like they need to be there in person, but if you can also search by artist medium, um, it's under resources resources find an artist so this is how we were talking about my photographer who took my um let's see find an artist is it my computer's running a little slow of course no. <laughs> um of course it would do this i checked before we started uh filming and that's how it would go but my <laughs> photographer who took my photos for the life-changing dog training that she is um she is an artist for you guys so she's a photographer and so um, this is so awesome that you guys have, you know, so you can just put in your city, state, um, country because you're in like 21 countries. Yeah, we That's are. Amazing. Which is so exciting to us. Um, yeah. and so you can search by location for photographers because obviously they need to be able to show up in person. But if you search by, um, artist medium, like if you were searching for a graphic designer or oh, something, yes. do more work, uh, remotely they're, they're a smaller group, but they are, you know, in lots of locations where they're happy to work with people, you know, over zoom or just over email or something like that. So yeah. there's some really great, um, some really, really wonderful people. We have, you know, a handful, more than a handful of artists who have been with us since the beginning. Um, and it, that is incredible for so many reasons. Like the fact yeah. that they're still volunteering, they're still doing this work. They're really dedicated to the, to the cause of helping animals. It's just incredible. Yeah. Um, because the yeah. animal industry is, you know, I'll just go back to the uh, front page too, when we talked about that, the animal industry is a hard industry to be in. I mean, I think there's a lot of hard industries, but that's one of the reasons that I'm doing this is because it's like the good news, you know, like let's be a light in the world. Um, you know, I've always said like, we can help more animals by working together. 
And yeah. so you guys have really, you know, just taken that and run with it to be like, you know, let's get all these artists to work together and help more animals. Right. And so you're helping, um, you know, you're just, you're just coming together for a greater cause. And so that's amazing. So while we're on your website, um, yeah. is there um, any other um, like programs and pages that you'd like to point yeah. out? Yeah. The other program that I think is really important to highlight um, that people can take advantage of is under programs. It's called the Marketing Resource Center. Oh, yes. Um, and that is really designed and it's really works magic for both the artists who are involved in our programs as well as shelters and rescues, but it's really created with an eye on um, the challenges that shelters and rescues and even advocacy groups. Wow, um, look at all this. This is amazing. <laughs> so okay. we have tons of templates. Like a lot of this leans towards the graphic design side, especially in the more recent years. Um, so things that are just meant to be like, you know what, we tried to do the heavy lifting but you can completely customize any of these. So you can change the brand colors. You can um, add your own graphics. You can, you know, switch things around if you don't like the layout. We tried to make it so that it's very, um, you know, the choose your own adventure. Like the power is in your hands to, yeah. to make this your own. But there's also some downloadable like educational materials as you get deeper into this library. So there are PDF um, kind of, booklets on how to take better photos, um, how to wow. take cell phone photos, this how to is awesome. read bios and things like that. There's a lot of bio writing materials in here as well. Um, and these all grow directly out of the current challenges that we are hearing from shelters and rescues. So, um, you know, there's like a space crisis meter, meter there that you see like for the shelters that are overcrowded and really need to get that word out to folks um, there are these incredible toolkits that we worked with uh, human animal support services on that are kind of multimedia. So there's press releases, there's talking points for the media, there's graphics, and there's kind of like a learn about this topic um, in all of the, these kinds of toolkits. So oh it's a really rich area that I'm I'm very proud of because yes, it's so awesome. And it's so <laughs> needed. Um, this is one of the themes that through every one of like my conversations is that, you know, shelters and rescues are crowded. And I mean, they are overcrowded and they have been. But is this something that you're seeing, um, especially since the pandemic? I know that a lot of shelters got emptied and that was wonderful. But yeah. then what we heard and this is our local rescues are not even taking owner surrenders anymore because they are so full. Yeah. So we have, and that's what you're hearing like around the country. Yeah. Nationally, there definitely seems to be, and there, you know, the, there's really great folks at like shelter animals count and some of these organizations that are trying to distill the data from kind of a national set to try to figure out and pinpoint a little bit more, like, why is this happening on a national level? And it really, I think what they've come to um, most recently is it's it's multifactored, right? So with the pandemic, we saw um, a lot of different things co-occurring following that, right? So intake started to pick back up, understaffing increased in shelters and rescues, um, some of the protocols that we were using during COVID and still holding on to after COVID started to hit that wall of like, well, it's not, um, you know, if we're not letting visitors in the building, it is you know, we're trying to increase safety, but it's having this awful effect of like slowing down the adoption processes right. and things like that. So it's a lot of different things I think that ha happened. Mm -hmm. And I, I also like to point out to people, like, I think that we have to consider what is happening nationally to every human that I know in that I feel like everyone I know is overwhelmed, both emotionally and logistically yes. right now. because um, and this is what another reason that I felt really called to do this is because what's happening with the animals you can look at that but it's direct related directly related to what's happening with the humans because the humans take care of the animals exactly right so if the humans are struggling then the animals are going to struggle 100% that yes. is okay always what I yes. say when people yes. are in trouble pets are in trouble too yes. you know and I think that 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 is a tougher thing for us to solve. Like, I think that as an industry, we're really good at trying to like identify problems and solve them. And I think what we're experiencing right now is a little bit trickier because it is it's a lot of moving targets that we're trying to put our fingers on. 
and this issue of um you know people being people suffering in lots of different ways and the way that that impacts pets I think that it simultaneously calls for us to be more compassionate about what is happening in our communities and to the people um because that's the only way that we're going to solve that is through wow. empathy and trying to figure out that problem while it also kind of zaps us of some of our capacity to care. Like we, yeah, I think a lot of us are experiencing compassion fatigue and things like that. So it's, it's a tricky situation. Um, but yes, I, I do feel like what I'm hearing from a lot of groups nationally is like, this, this is kind of feels unprecedented. Like it feels yes. like we have a lot of animals who are staying longer. Yes animals that typically they would have seen gone home faster are still waiting. So I, I think that it's, um, it's a tough moment for everybody. Yeah, agreed. And so I'm so glad that, you know, we're talking about this because that's the, I feel like the first step is for people to understand we're not alone. Like you're in, like, you know, this is what, you know, uh, most people in the animal industry are feeling this. And so it is important to, you know, more than ever, right, to work together, to reach out um, yeah. and to just know you're, that we're not alone in this. And so, um, and find other ways, like different ways to work together, you know? Yeah. And so yeah, and it's really where like the Heart Speak programs all grow out of that feeling of like, we may not be able to solve everything, but here's the piece that we can offer something on, you know, like we can help you communicate some of those problems and solutions better to the community so that hopefully over time we can get more people involved. We can get more people to take action. Um, it's the, the thing that I feel like sometimes we can feel a little bit of control over when everything else feels out of control, you know? Right. So that's what I really wanted our website to be as well is to help empower people with information because I feel like information sharing, I mean, knowledge is power, right? So to help people understand that they can rehome um, animals on their own, that, right, just taking them to a shelter and rescue, that's not always the answer, you know, and um, the, my last apprentice that I interviewed, you know, she's traveling around the world and since you guys are in 21 countries, you know, my degree is in sociology. And so looking at, and every community, how they solve animal problems is different, right? Around our country, every, that alone is different because they have to come with solutions that fit their community. And then you look at um, other countries, right? Yeah. And so um, just because you have knowledge in this area, I'm going to ask you, uh, but do you see, um, are there things that you see in other countries that are different than um, here in the United States, the issues that they're having? Yeah. So it's it varies wide widely depending on where some of our other members are located. Um, you know, we have a member who works who actually lives in the U.S. but does a ton of work in Spain, and he's particularly working on issues that affect hunting dogs like the galgos um, and pendancos, which are like our equivalent of greyhounds. Um, and just you know, there are some very particular issues to that one group of dog in Spain. We have a member in Italy who you know, they don't see as much overcrowding in their shelters, but they do sometimes struggle with getting people to um, adopt from shelters because there's a pull towards um, more purebred dogs in her area. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very different problem from, you know, members in South America who are dealing with a lot of street dogs or who are trying to um, just get dogs into safety, which is a, a different yes. problem, you know, or yes. dealing with large scale spay and neuter because they're trying to yes. prevent overpopulation of animals who who can't yeah. even make it into shelters and rescues so right. it does look really different everywhere yes and but the thread that stays the same no matter where you're at and what community and what country is that the humans have to work together in order to solve the problems of the animals right Exactly. And I think that oh. particular, I've been thinking about this a lot for, for many years, but I think that the, I think it's most, it's even more relevant now than it has ever been is we also um, need as an industry to stop separating ourselves from the community. Like yes. we tend to really see ourselves in a, a bit of an us versus them scenario with the community. Uh -huh. 
And I think it's easy to get there. We have a different set of knowledge at our fingertips. Once you're doing this work for a little bit, you, you can hardly remember what it was like to just be like an average pet owner in the community. Yes. So you're talking about the pet professionals, people that are doing this, right? And so that's in the pet owners and just being right because- Yeah, you feel like you're separated from them a little bit and, and knowledge does that, you know, in all kinds of topics. But I think that what we're all being encouraged to consider and what I think will make the biggest difference is if we start to see ourselves as of the community instead yes. of separate from it, you know? Yes. And so that's why I, you know, I do help um, people wanting to get into the pet industry, pet professionals, but I also want this to be for pet owners. So, you know, it's like a podcast for pet professionals, but pet parents too. Yeah. So pet parents and pet professionals, because that's how... Um, and your founder as well, but when you have a dog that, or an animal, right, that impacts your life and, you know, um, we were, we, that's how most of us started out as pet owners, yeah, and you're like, exactly. oh, right, because you want to help them, you know, you love them so much and it's our love for the animals, right, and a lot of people getting into the pet industry, though, they would say, well, I like animals more than humans or when I want to work with the animals. And then I would say, well, here's the thing. You have to yeah. work with the humans. <laughs> so exactly. you have to have the love for the humans too. And you have to empower them and equip them with tools because if you don't help the human, their animal's not going to get help. Exactly. So. The animals don't get to advocate for themselves. There's yep. a lot of human involvement. And yeah, the lifeblood of our entire work are pet owners and fosters and volunteers and people with more informal roles in all of this are what keep it going like we yes. most organizations could do nothing without volunteers yes without the people behind the scenes just showing up right they don't take the glory right there yeah like exactly in the, in the trenches and so um and so yeah I'm gonna do a whole podcast I plan to you know on compassion fatigue and talk about this because you know uh, again it, it it's lifting each other up, propping each other up when, you know, it's <laughs> when you just yeah. feel like you want to fall over and you're like, I can't do this anymore, you know? And so, um, it's about, yeah, helping each other. So, um, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. I mean, I think you did talk about how you got into the, you know, animal industry, your work in the animal farm foundation. If you want to talk about that, um, sure. I can, and, and then roll into, yeah, the other stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that I came to some of the big picture thoughts that I have about animal welfare from um, starting with Animal Farm Foundation. Um, I, I think like so many people, like I didn't really know that there was a place for me in animal welfare. Like I, I didn't really know that it was like a formalized field. I yes. knew that I loved animals. Mm -hmm. And when I got out of college, all I knew, I was an English major who was just like, lost you know I was only an English major because I didn't know what I was doing or what yes, I wanted. sociology yes I didn't know yes right um and I I knew at the time that I was graduating I had done some like externships with nonprofits, and that felt the best to me is like doing um doing nonprofit work because it felt I liked that feeling of like a mission and a drive towards something that was bigger than you know just the thing in front of me yeah. <laughs> and so I was looking for, desperately for jobs. I graduated from college um, right when the recession hit um, in 2008. So it was a it was a tough moment to find a you know a job, and so I was searching for a long time and saw this posting for an administrative assistant with a local nonprofit called Animal Farm Foundation, and I was like never heard of them <laughs> and um, ended up interviewing. And long story short, I got that job and over the years um, was able to work my way up through the organization to where I was eventually the assistant director after um, eight years there, yes. So, which was lovely. Oh, <laughs> so awesome. I mean, yes. Yeah, so both of these organizations, I mean, I have known about for a very long time. So yeah, <laughs> I was in the dark when I started. Um, but what Animal Farm foundation really gave me and their mission um, at the time when I joined them was really laser focused on uh, pit bull dogs and how to overcome not only some of the community level discrimination, so places that had breed specific legislation and um, overcoming policy issues on the homeowners insurance and, and side of things, things like that. Their other real initiative was to work on where discrimination was coming from within the field, like a lot of bad 
policy and kind of um, reinforcing of ideas as pit bulls as different from other dogs was sadly coming from within. It was coming from within our field through our adoption policies, through the way that we were marketing um, those specific dogs. And it was really a watershed moment. I'm very lucky that I got that job when I did because it was right after things really started to change. The, the first group of dogs from a dog fighting situation were saved, you know, and not destroyed. Oh, Lord. Yes, that's right. Exactly. And so it was a real moment of reckoning, not only in the community, but in our field as yeah. professionals, really looking at like, what role do we play and how can we improve things? Um, especially if this group of dogs is kind of disproportionately entering our shelter because of community level issues and things like that. So um, I was very lucky to to learn from some really amazing people and to also get the opportunity to dive into the educational kind of um, B2B resources, right? So like, how do we resource each other in this field? Um, and immediately found that that was my passion. <laughs> I loved getting to go to many different shelters. I loved getting to see how things were very different in each community and also how similar we were and how everybody was so sure that they had unique problems, you know, to their facility or to their community, but how that was happening everywhere. So, yes. so there was so much commonality that we could kind of unpack and, and start to get a hold of. So I really came to my passion in this work of like, let's look at a problem and try to develop solutions that will work across different communities. Um, through that organization, I'm very grateful. And because Lisa, um, the executive director of HeartSpeak was volunteering there, HeartSpeak was a, a volunteer run organization. And when she got the opportunity to start to hire staff, it was at, at a similar moment where I was kind of ready to do something a little bit different. And it just all kind of came together that I was able to hop over to HeartSpeak and, and you know, kind of dive into their education initiatives. Wow, that's so awesome. So I don't know if you know, but in 2004, so in our community here, if you know this in Council Bluffs in the city, I live in the county, but there's a ban here. Um, mm -hmm. and so we started I Wins Against Breed Specific Legislation um, in 2004, which is how I came to learn about, um, you know, Animal Farm Foundation because all of yeah. the resources that they gave us and, you know, um, we educated the community that was in, you know, our council members and you know, I mean, that was a long battle, you know, a few years. And so it was so emotional, right? It was a very big deal. Um, you know, they ended up implementing the ban, you know, which still felt like a loss, but it was a victory that they were allowing, they were grandfathering in the, the dogs um, because, that, because the original proposal was that they were going to come in, right, and take all of the dogs, um, which is similar to what Denver did. And and again, it is unique in our country. This is what I, you know, I want to, I plan to interview the folks that um, you know, are involved in this Islands Against BSL, which is a good yeah. solution, but um, where cities have more power than the state, the state has more power than the federal government. And so, you know, that is not, that is not the same in every country, right? right. So the city of Denver being able to sue the state of Colorado when the state came in and said, you cannot implement breed bans. And so our state is looking at doing something like that, but people don't realize. So it is important to get involved locally, right? Yeah. And in every aspect of the, what we're talking about, how to help animals, but it always starts in your community. Yeah. And so um, so then we were able to, so in the county where I live, um, pit bulls are, are legal. And because of the work that I've done, you know, I was able to work with the, the local shelter and write um, a pit bull adoption. Uh, yeah. Uh, application, which didn't exist before. And then even our other uh, Humane Society, when I got out of college in 2000, and oh, I'm not aging myself, but 2002, 2000, uh, you know, this is when I started studying, right, animals in society and what was going on. Um, but they were just euthanizing the pit bulls when they came in, if they look like them. I mean, these puppies, right, there was rows of them, and they were just euthanizing them. So at least now, like people, it's still not where we would want you know, things to yeah. be. But when we look back right in the last 20 years and I explain to people how far we've come and at least that they're being adopted out, um, it does take longer because they can't be adopted out in the city. And then, right, it brings up a whole bunch of prejudice and, you know, yeah, there's a real understand. 
Yeah. And there's a real like waterfall of impact when something like that is happening at every level that those dogs are touching, you know? Um, and the media does that's a hard. really good job of uh, flaming, you know, fanning yeah. the flame. I feel like, you know, even since 2020, they've done a really good job of, uh, you know, making people feel all kinds of emotions about things. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's important that um, you know, people that are in the industry, right, talk, speak truth like we are right today about, uh -huh. you know, what's happening and, you know, the nature, like the truth about these animals and, um, yeah. you know, and how I think it's each other. important to remember that pit bulls are often a lightning rod for um, issues with humans in the community, like that pit bulls are often used as an excuse to uh -huh. get to discriminating against groups of people in the community. There's a book called um, Pitbull by um, Bronwyn Dickey uh -huh. that is really amazing. And and I think you, if you haven't read it, you would love it because it really takes kind of a sociological look at how did we get here? Like, how did we get to the point where um, this group of dogs was kind of being made other, you know, in a, in the groups of dogs that are- yes. have our country and how that's happened to other groups of dogs over time but this has been stickier what has happened to pit bulls and how it's inextricably really tied to some really bad policies against human beings you know so there's I think it's important to remember all of that and what Animal Farm gave me was really this gift of looking at everything <laughs> in a big picture kind of way and I think the way that we've brought that to marketing and HeartSpeak is really always thinking about the unintended consequences of our messaging. So like, have we considered that when we are using language that isn't widely understood by the community, that that has a deep unintended consequence in terms of how we are not reaching, you know, everyone in our community, how we're further kind of separating ourselves out from being of the community. Um, I got all of that way of thinking about things and really considering um, language really closely and how how marketing has this incredible power to not just tell the story that you're telling in that moment, but tell a bigger story about your organization and how you care for people and animals. And like every moment in marketing has this opportunity to not only do one small thing, but also tell this bigger part of a, a story. Yes. Know? Yeah. So good. So important. And so there's links, you know, on our website to Animal, Animal Farm Foundation and also, you know, for breed specific legislation, because, right, we shouldn't be discriminating against humans or animals and, you know, holding people accountable on the basis of their behavior, not the way that they look. I mean, that's yeah. pretty widely um, exactly. accepted. <laughs> um, you know, it should be, um, you know, uh, so that's awesome. And so then, yeah, so uh, you start your work with um, Heart Speak. And so can you tell us, I'm going to try to keep track of time here, all right, because, uh, you know, I want to honor that. Um, so can you tell us like then what you came to love, why you do what you do, um, you know, with Heart Speak and, you know, maybe how long you've been doing that? Sure. So I've now been with HeartSpeak for um, about eight years too. So that, that's my, um, I've been really lucky to be here this long. And what I, what keeps me in this work, what I love deeply about this work is the people doing the work. I, I love animals. I love getting to go to shelters and meet all sorts of animals. But the thing that gets me up in the morning and makes me want to do this work are the amazing people that I've met. Um, the staff members who are, you know, persevering through really difficult moments, um, the volunteers, the administrators, even, you know, like it's, it it's made really, me cry <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, it's, uh... it's really about them, you know, and it's, we've touched on this, like it's, this is hard work. It's hard physical. It's hard emotional. It's hard psychologically sometimes this yeah. work and the people being able to do even just one thing that can make their lives a little bit easier in the difficult work that they're doing. That is why I want to keep doing this. You know, I didn't plan on crying. I don't have a tissue. So, uh, <laughs> but yes, that's, um, you know, because I hit a point in 2020 where I wasn't sure after 20 years in the industry, if I could go on, you yeah. know, because we had to shut down our business. It was like everything was falling apart around us. People were fighting. It was like, what is happening in the world? 
Yeah. And so um, luckily God had a plan. And so here we are, you know, so I, I am just so thankful when I read that and you said that, in, you know, and it says that in your bio and you talk about like loving the humans and I'm like, oh, this is it. Because again, where we just go back to like, you know, um, we're all connected and, you know, we all do this because we love animals, but we have to love each other too. And so um, that's the really great. And so um, can you talk a little bit about the biggest challenges that you've um, faced then? I mean, we've kind of touched upon, you know, some of the, some of the challenges in the animal industry, but um, your time working with animals. I think that, um, again, for me, it's the, it, it's a human component in that it is understaffing and high, high rates of turnover. And I, and these are not probably that I want to lay at the feet of the people who are leaving. Like, I think that there's a real reason that uh, there are several real reasons that we have high rates of turnover and why it's very hard for people to sustain in this work. Um, and that is, I want to say very clearly, not the fault of anybody who is making a choice to leave this field. Like sometimes that's the most important healthy choice for someone to make. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do as an industry on things that are big picture, like fair pay for the people who are working for us, benefits for the people that are working for yes. us, making sure that people are being given some of the tools and just some of the um, logistical, you know, life giving yes. uh, resources to make it possible for them to stay in this work long term. Um, and then I think that you know, what happens with turnover, high rates of turnover and understaffing is the people who do stay continue to get more and more burnt out or they're being asked to do more and more. And from, I'll bring it back to my specific work with HeartSpeak where that can start to impact um, the way that we are reaching our community is that we have less and less people who have less and less time to work on issues of okay, we have this really amazing hard work happening within our four walls. How do we get that message out? How do we get more animals out when there's not enough people or those people are burned out? That's typically the first thing to go, right? So we're, we're maybe not as effectively um, marketing not only the animals who need to get out, but our services and our organization, which then makes us less shiny and attractive for new employees or for community members who could be volunteering. So it's really this domino effect. And I'm just speaking to the marketing piece. It has such a big impact on operations and on leadership. And, you know, it, it's many faceted. Um, I just want to speak to what I know. Yes. And that's that, you know, marketing can start to feel like a luxury and not a necessity when things get very difficult internally. And I think that that's where that kind of thinking is what can lead us to just uh, breaking off that connection with our community. And that's really how I want people to think about marketing is not as like this slick, fancy, you know, kind of advertising agency ver version of marketing. It's literally like establishing a, a line to your community that you can start to provide education and also, you know, like important information and uh, kind of that two-way street of starting to build a relationship. Um, that's how I tend to think of marketing. And so yes. if that breaks down, it does start to impact all the other things as well. Yes. It starts with let's keep and retain our really amazing people who are doing this work, you know? Yes, it's so good. And we talked a little bit about that when, before we started recording about, um, you know, how I created something under a dog training company to help people get into the industry because there wasn't a clear path when we, right. When we graduated and, you know, this, you know, may, may or may not be on people's um, radar to get into the industry. But then when they're in, right, how do how do they stay there? Right. Because, again, it is so hard. Um, all the things that you touched on, it's so important, you know, that um, people are being taken care of um, because, you know, um, it's a hundred billion dollar animal industry. And so then people go, oh, I can make money doing this. And that's great. But, um, you know, you, again, taking care of the people mentally, physically, you know, emotionally, spiritually. And so um, I just hope to, that, you know, just by having these conversations, we're going to shine a light 
you know, on what's going on and that people can listen to this, you know, pet professionals and then people thinking about getting into the industry, people that are volunteering, um, you know, and just being there for each other. And part of what we created was a community, like so that they could, you know, talk to each other, rely on each other, you know, um, and I didn't have that when I started. No one really wanted to help me. They looked at me as, like, as their competition. So yeah. I, said, I want to be a dog trainer. I want to be a pet sitter. And luckily it was one pet sitter. You know, she shared her information with me and she was very, you know, so kind, you know, and I always, you know, I never forget that. Right. Uh, and she runs a rescue. And so her heart was, you know, I, I say to my um, apprentices, I was talking to one of uh, a girl last night and she's running puppy classes. But I said, if you had a million dollars, what would you do? You know? And so it's like, would you do this work for free? Right. Yeah. Would you do it because you love it? Yeah. You know, and so that's really the thing that, you know, people should do. Right. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you know, money wasn't an issue, but, you know, you, you got to just you got to do it for the love. And um, but it, it is such a hard right. It's like when I would say that the, the animals aren't the, you know, the hardest part, it's the humans. And also, um, you know, the, the animal problems you know, from, yeah, in 20 years studying socio, like the sociological aspect, it's the human issues. We can just, right, get everybody to work together and, um, you know, figure it well, and you guys are doing it. It's amazing. So what you guys are doing, all the information that you have going into the trenches, you're helping the animals, you know, get out, you know, through marketing and art, you know, um, but you're doing so much more than that, you know, Thank so- you. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, so just gonna stay on track here, and then we'll, you know, uh, try to wrap it up because I could keep talking to you for hours. So you're inspired. I know you're so me. easy to talk to. <laughs> oh, good, you made me cry. It's so wonderful. Like that's good. Those are good tears. Um, because people, and I always would say, animals just want to feel understood, and people just want to feel understood. So when they do, it's like, oh wow, someone sees me, someone understands me, and what I'm going through. And um, that's what I want to do with this. So it's just thank you so much for just, you know, your honesty and your work and, you know, continuing and not to give up, you know. Yeah, um, thank you. Yes. So um, so what are some of the things that people can do to help with the problems, you know, that we're facing? Um, yeah. yeah, let's just talk about that. I think, um, you know, depending on what your current role is in this industry like the through heart speak we always love to have more volunteers more people who want to lend some time um whether that's through photography or a different form of art even writing um we were talking about before we started um just how incredible having people who are have a way with words or you know enjoy um writing social captions or bios for animals like that's so important when people are meeting animal meeting animals for the first time through the internet most of the time um having them have really strong profiles is still a really critical part of this work so I think that there's a lot of different ways that people can get involved on that level um and then I think the way that we can all give each other a little bit of grace is just being you know empathetic and compassionate to I think that we're getting a little bit better at being compassionate about what's happening um, with community members. And we need to remember that like some of our colleagues are in that same boat, you know, like we're offering services to the community that sometimes our underpaid colleagues also could benefit from. And, and so they also need our, our grace and understanding um, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're working yeah. together. Um, so good. And yeah. And then you, you talk about um, national organization you mentioned, um, to support workers, you said on a positive note, there are organizations working at a national level to support workers through the challenge of saving more lives and helping more families. Are there yeah. specific organizations that you would like to? I have? would say one of my favorite national orgs to follow along with is Maddie's Fund. Oh, yeah. um, they're just doing so much to try to bring people together, um, whether it's through their weekly community conversations or they have uh, message boards, the um, their Maddie's message boards where people can really kind of dive in and talk to each other. And they're, they've just been so lovely, especially in the last few years about like really trying to bring as many people together who are trying to pull in the same direction. Um, and they're offering a lot of opportunities for people to connect online, even if they're awesome. not. I'm going to check it out. So yeah. listeners will check that out too. So um, awesome. So this is called the Good News Podcast. 
So again, we just want to talk about the good news, you know, in the world that people are working together because there's so much when I decided, I said, I want to focus on the good news. And, you know, I've had my head down doing the work with dogs and I look up and it's like, all right, what's going on in the animal industry? This is what I used to study, right? And it's like, what's yeah. happening? Oh, look at what they're doing. That's amazing. Look what they're doing. That's amazing. Look at what they're doing. And I'm like, there's so much. I don't know where to begin. You yeah. know, so uh, it's amazing. This is all good news, you know, um, I think what you guys do. Um, but if you want to talk a little bit, I just say, you know, can you tell us about the good news? Obviously, I mean, I think people get the idea of the good news of what you guys um, offer. Um, mm. You know, it's just really good what you said, and I can't even read it. Uh, but you know, it's all good news, guys. Um, the good news about the work that HeartSpeak is doing, you said you can make uh help make day-to-day -day life in the animal world just a little bit easier by supporting deeper community connections. Um, we all have the power to change the way our individual communities not only see individual animals, but the work that we do and every effort we make is changing the narrative around living with animals. So it's so it. cool. We all have, you know, whether it's just a social post that you're doing or a photo that you're taking, like we all have that capacity to change a life for both and your of phone right so the phone right the camera <laughs> on your phone right the post that you share the work yeah. there's so many things that people can do right and how they can get involved in that they might not think it's a big deal but it is you know every little thing so I just know when someone you know shares my post or they give me they're like good job keep going exactly. like, okay exactly. we can do this so <laughs> Um, okay, so people can find you on LinkedIn. Um, yep. We'll put links to you uh, and your organization um, in this description. Um, again, you guys can find um, links to HeartSpeak on our website. Um, and is and let's see, yeah, that's on Instagram. Oh, HeartSpeak on Instagram and Facebook. And um, I just thank you so much for your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap it up? I don't think so. I think um, in terms of like new resources that people can check out from us, that stock photo um, project is called pets and people photos.org. And it's all free stock photos for shelters and rescues or anybody doing this work um, as an advocate. And we also have a cell phone photography course coming out at the end of the summer that I'm so excited about. And that'll all, you know, like all heart speak stuff, we, it's free. So we want people to be able to take advantage of it. Wow. That's so awesome. I have a girl who helped me, a lady who helped me film um, my videos. And so she does a, a cell phone course. So I'm going to share your information with her too. So awesome. awesome. Okay. Thank you. So lovely. Thank you. Yay, thank you so much. God bless you guys for the work that you do. Um, we just, we thank you. And again, I've known about you guys for so long. And when you agreed to do this, I was so excited. I was like, wow this is it's so amazing so you you know we are changing lives and that's just important to you know to remember that um we are changing and saving lives by the work that we're doing and so don't give up and uh we just we thank you and i think that's a wrap Barry. Right. <laughs> okay thank say bye barry say thanks <laughs> okay he's ready okay thank you so much caitlin thank you okay bye-bye Bye.